Welcome to a WALS webinar. We have with us today, Dr. Erin Grabacic. She's with the biology department, Valdosta State. And as you can see here, she's gonna talk about uh, particularly says so animal behavior, but especially birds and what <laughs> effects humans are having on those, including by the rivers and the Okefenokee Swamp. And I'm not gonna say a lot more. Uh, I'm, by the way, Samani Riverkeeper, John S. Quarterman, that's project and staff position with Walls Watershed Coalition, Inc., a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, so I'm not gonna say much more about Dr. G because she introduces herself pretty well in her slides. Over to you. All right. Thank you. So, yes, I am Erin Grabarczyk, um, or as my students say, Dr. G, but Erin is just fine. <laughs> um, so a little bit about myself. I grew up in Toledo, Ohio. I got an undergraduate degree from Miami University in Ohio, a master's degree at Eastern Kentucky University in Richmond, Kentucky. I did my PhD in Kalamazoo, Michigan um, at Western Michigan University. And then after my PhD, I came down here to South Georgia to do a postdoc with the USDA. Um, I was in the Southeast Watershed Branch. And um, starting in 2022, I was hired by Valdosta State University in the biology department. Um, so this looks like a really clear straight path, straight line up and down I-75. But actually, when I went to school and started studying, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no idea I was going to end up um, or pursue a career in ecology or do field biology. Um, actually, when I finished my undergraduate degree, I did what so many of our biology students do, and that is go into a clinical setting. Um, so I worked as a clinical uh, microbiologist, diagnostic microbiologist for about five years in Cincinnati um, at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital. I love the job. I love infectious diseases, thinking about infectious diseases. What I didn't like was being inside all the time. Um, <laughs> and so when I was there working, um, I was also thinking about birds. And so it was um, some experiences I had as an undergraduate that motivated me to go back to school and pursue a degree in ecology. Um, and as I've gone through um, my research, my studies, I'm really driven by this idea that humans are causing really big changes to the environment. The biggest change to animals across the planet, um, plants and animals across the planet, is habitat change and loss. So that might just be degradation of habitat, so like breakdown or lower quality habitats. It's also when habitats completely change. Um, other ways that humans are influencing animals is through overharvesting, like illegal um, pet trades um, or animal trade, wildlife trade, um, introduction of exotic species, pollution, chemical, light, sound. Um, and then on top of all of that, they're dealing with climate change. So how do animals respond to all of this um, that's happening in their environment that we're doing to their environment? They tend to do one of three things, avoid, adjust, or adapt. So they might completely avoid um, a degraded habitat, either in space or time. Uh, they might adjust their behaviors like really quickly or flexibly, um, change how they're interacting in their environment. Or over really long periods of time, we might expect that some populations of animals may start to adapt to the changes that we've made in the environment. And so this really kind of um, frames how I um, approach research and like what really drives my interest in working with animals. And that is understanding how animals respond to the changes that we're making in their environment. Um, and I do that really in two settings, either through urbanization, so just us humans living in places, and through agriculture. So agriculture takes up a very large proportion of land on our planet. And it's different than natural habitats. And so how do animals deal with this really big change in their environment? Um, so I'll talk about kind of three areas of research today. Um, some noise effects on birds, 
bird diets, and then very briefly on some of the new work I'm doing um, out in the Okefenokee. But we'll start with how noise affects bird, um, bird songs and how the social context modifies those responses. So anthropogenic noise or human generated noise overlaps or masks bird songs. So what you're looking at in this picture here is what we call a spectrogram. So this is two songs stacked on top of each other, but this line shows frequency or pitch and this line shows time. And then the color or the depth, like how dark it is right there, shows how loud a sound is. So on the bottom, you can see a normal bird song, um, but on the top, all of that kind of like fuzzy background noise, that's noise masking. That's human noise, like traffic noise, which is usually low frequency, overlapping with the bird signal. So what do birds do? A lot of birds will shift the pitch of their song. So they'll sing songs at a higher minimum frequency or at a higher minimum pitch, which reduces the overlap from songs a little bit. But this could have consequences for how other birds perceive what they're saying, basically. So where my area of research or where my research comes in is thinking about how noise pollution affects communication. So the signaler gives a call, that call transmits through the environment to another bird, so the receiver. But if noise overlaps with the song or they change their songs, that might change what the receiver hears. Social context is also really important. So birds like us, I mean, maybe you talk to yourself a lot. I do. <laughs> but most of the time when I'm talking, it's for a purpose, right? I'm trying to get some information across. Same with birds. Um, and so they're calling for different reasons. And so um, definitely where my research was novel and new um, is thinking about why birds are calling in the first place and how that affects their responses. So a signaler may give a call. Is he calling to repel another male from his territory or is he calling to attract a female? Um, and so the first uh, couple of pieces of research I'm going to share with you are really looking at this question, how does noise and social context affect these calling patterns? So, um, my study species was the house wren. Unfortunately, we don't get house wrens breeding here. <laughs> they overwinter here, um, but they are a bird that will breed across a noise gradient. So you might find them in very rural places. Um, you might find them in very urban places or suburban places. Um, they're great because they breed in nest boxes or birdhouses. So it's pretty easy to track the birds and keep an eye on them. Um, here's one of their songs. So they have these lovely complex songs um, that overlap with noise. Oops. <laughs> so when I initially went out, I was thinking about birds prior to the time that they had laid eggs. So prior to clutch initiation. And I was focusing in on unpaired males and paired males. Unpaired males because they sing to attract a mate, right? So they're broadcasting, the reason they would be broadcasting their calls over really, really long distances because they're not necessarily sure where female birds are located, but they still need to attract a mate, right? So they might be more likely to adjust their calls compared to paired males who've already attracted a mate. And so it's most likely that they're directing their songs over a shorter distance, either to their neighbors or to their breeding partner. And so I tested, do paired and unpaired males respond to noise the same way? So to do that, I went out and recorded house wrens singing at their nest box. Another great thing about house wrens is they <laughs> sing right at their box. Um, and I, so I recorded a time period without any noise playbacks and then um, broadcast really high intensity noise. So I was changing the noise environment where these birds were singing. 
And then I measured their songs. So using those spectrograms to understand how they were shifting their songs and then testing whether the treatment, high intensity noise or control changed whether paired or unpaired males sing their, uh, changed their songs. So what I found was that unpaired males sing longer songs at a higher rate. So again, they are trying to attract a mate. So they're putting a lot of energy into broadcasting those songs. Contrary to predictions, it was paired males who adjusted their songs. We thought it would be unpaired males because they were trying to be heard by females. What we found was that paired males changed, they um, increased the frequency of their songs. So it could be that females are selecting males based on frequency. This happens in a lot of birds and a lot of females prefer low frequency song. And so it may be that the unpaired males were not adjusting their songs because they didn't want to be perceived as less fit. Um, mm -hmm. Paired males might adjust their songs because they're already paired. And so the female's probably not going to leave. They've already invested in a nest. The alternative explanation is that the unpaired males are unpaired for a reason. And it's because they're not changing their songs. <laughs> so do all males respond the same way to noise? They do not. Um, and so this really got me thinking about, okay, so we see on average what the birds are doing, right? And we know generally in polluted areas, um, noise polluted areas, birds sing differently, right? This is a really common sort of um, behavioral change that we see. If we look across a gradient of noise, so like different places that get noisier and noisier, we also see that birds tend to change their songs as it gets noisier. But if we think about noise pollution, particularly noise pollution that humans produce, it can vary and change rapidly and dramatically. Um, so what you're looking at in this picture, this is showing noise levels here on the um, y-axis. And then here on this line here, that's showing time. So this is a one hour recording from Western Michigan University's um, campus. And each of those spikes or peaks in noise or peaks in the line is a burst of noise. Um, so when we listened to the recordings, that was things like an airplane flying over, a train going by, um, one of the buses driving by and hitting the air brakes. These are really, really loud events that aren't really long, but they're really loud. And so we use this system, this idea, oops, to... Oh, maybe there's not another slide there to look at how the birds, how the wrens were rapidly or like immediately changing their calls relative to this noise. So when we looked at that, what we found was, um, well, and for this study, we focused just on paired males. We knew that paired males changed their calls from the prior study. Um, and so we were interested to see if we could kind of tease apart more of the pattern there that what was going on. So what we found was that males tend to drop the frequency of their song when their female breeding partner was fertile. Um, didn't matter how noisy it was. This was just something we saw overall across the birds. But when we looked at song duration, uh, what we found was that the males were plastically or flexibly changing their songs. So what you're looking at here is either the birds are decreasing or increasing their songs, um, depending on whether that line is pointing up or pointing down. And then the length of the line shows kind of the gradient of noise that they were singing, different conditions they were singing in. Um, so what we found was that the birds maybe are not adjusting frequency um, immediately, like if an airplane flies over, but they are changing the duration of their song. So they are adjusting their songs, but possibly in a way that may or may not affect their ability to attract mates and keep a breeding partner. Um, so the next step with this work would be to ask, okay, those males that change and change their songs the most, does that help them? 
does that improve their reproductive success? Do they attract a female? Does that female lay more eggs? Are they better at um, fledging offspring? And so really trying to link these like flexible behaviors with um, whether or not that's advantageous. Um, so what my work in this system looked at was signaler behavior, which I've just kind of shared with you now. I also looked at how house wren signals transmit in different noise environments. And what we found was at the, some of the noisiest sites where the wrens were breeding, their songs are not detectable even within the male's own territory. So his song is not audible by other birds that are breeding right next door. Um, I also looked at receiver perception. So specifically with territory defense, what I found was that the wrens were relying more so on physical combat to get rid of intruders and noise than their songs. So songs are pretty like a pretty low investment, low risk way to repel an intruder, just to say, hey, this is my place, get out of here. If a um, interaction escalates, then birds are more likely to chase each other, to get into fights, but that's really risky because you can get hurt. Um, and so what this research showed was that noise was not affecting their ability to detect intruders on their territory, but it did change how they dealt with intruders. Um, so combined, the this has implications for, again, reproductive success in these different types of quality habitats. Um, population dynamics, will we see birds continue to persist in really noisy areas or not? Um, and led me to another question. So while I was out um, working with these birds, monitoring nest boxes, um, I was also thinking about how else uh, habitat change, differences in habitat, habitat quality might affect these birds. Um, so again, it might affect their ability to find a mate. It could change parental investment. Um, but what I was especially interested in was diet. Um, so we'll go on to the next uh, kind of area here, which is linking bird diets to their habitat or their landscape. Um, and so specifically for this, I was monitoring house wrens in an urban location, an urban forest and a rural, a rural forest. Um, and over two years, I banded a lot of birds. So to band a bird, um, you put a little silver aluminum band on their leg. It's a numbered band. And so um, that band is trackable if anyone were to say, catch my bird um, or a bird that I had banded, I would get a record, I get a record of that. Um, encounter. Um, so that was for two years monitored nestlings in these um, two places and then collected fecal samples from the nestlings at two time points. So when they were really, really, really small prior to, um, they were about five to seven days post-hatch. So they didn't have their main body feathers yet and their eyes were closed. The second time I banded the nestlings, they had full body track feathers and were capable of like really weak short distance flight, but not quite ready to fledge yet. So um, I was asking the question, how does habitat affect nestling diet and fitness? Um, so we measured how much the nestlings weighed, how long their tarsus or their leg was, um, and then took a ratio of body mass to tar uh, leg length um, as a measure of body condition, and then took these fecal samples. So we used a process called DNA metabarcoding. So in DNA metabarcoding, you take a sample and you crush it up so that you can pull out the DNA, you can extract the DNA. Then what we did was we looked at the arthropod genome and took out a teeny, teeny, tiny little section that's shared between arthropods. We used that strip of DNA to amplify or make copies of the arthropod DNA that was in the bird fecal samples. We sent that off to a center to sequence the DNA. And then once we had those sequences, we could take them and match them to a database that would tell us what insects were found in that fecal sample. 
Um, so here's what we found. So clutch sizes, so the number of eggs in a nest declined over the season. This isn't too unexpected. That's pretty common with most birds. Um, interestingly, what we found was that the proportion of birds to survive, so the number that actually hatched and made it to fledging, declined over the season, but that decline was a lot bigger in the urban habitat. We also found that the urban nestlings were in slightly less um, or poorer body condition than the rural nestlings. We found a lot of different insects in nestling diets. So the parents are provisioning many, many, many different types of insects. The two that really stood out and were the most abundant um, were here. Those are Orthoptera, so crickets and grasshoppers, and Lepidoptera. So that would be like butterflies, moths, caterpillars. So we focused in on those two insect groups. Um, and so what we found was that Early season nestlings or adults are provisioning nestlings with a lot of leps. So that again, that's caterpillars um, from butterflies, moths, or maybe the butterfly or moth itself. Um, but around the end of June, the presence of this insect drops in the nestling diets and they switch to orthoptera or crickets and grasshoppers. So generally caterpillars um, are thought to be really, really good sources of nutrition and food for nestlings. Something like a grasshopper or a cricket might not be as high quality. They're kind of crunchy, um, a little bit harder to digest. So it's possible that one of the reasons we see um, kind of clutches start to fail later in the season or just get smaller is because of food availability, also because of the types of food that are available. So we didn't see any difference in what the birds were eating between the urban and the rural place. We did see differences again in body condition and survivorship in the rural nestling or in the urban nestling, sorry. Um, so this could be simply due to um, provisioning patterns. It's possible that maybe higher quality parents are settling in the rural areas. If you have a high quality parent, maybe they're bringing more food to the offspring. It could also be the quantity and quality of insects that the parents are providing to the nestlings. Um, so maybe um, there was a, a one caterpillar, but then they got a lot of something else. Um, it's also possible that insect diversity and abundance is different between these two types of habitats, which is something that we did not measure. <laughs> So I'm gonna transition a little bit now and talk about some of the work um, with avian diets that I've done here in Georgia. So as a postdoc, I worked in a stick bug lab. <laughs> um, so we spent a lot of time researching and thinking about uh, conservation biological control. So that is using natural enemies like predators and parasitoids to regulate pest populations. Um, so BMSB or the brown marm is a really big pest and it's becoming a bigger and bigger pest um, down here in South Georgia. It's an invasive species and it loves to eat crops. Actually, it loves to eat just about anything. Um, and so the BMSB is really mobile. And so one of the issues that growers run into is that it'll move into their crop fields, maybe eat a ton of peaches, destroy some peaches, and then it moves back into the forest wow. um, and it will eat things in the forest. And so it's a hard insect to control because it's constantly on the move. Um, it also likes to aggregate and will just really wipe out um, a lot of food sources. So we know that there are several arthropod predators and parasitoids, but vertebrate predation was assumed. No one had actually shown that vertebrates eat BMSB. And so um, what I wanted to do with this project was ask whether insectivorous birds provide biocontrol or biological control 
of BMSB and other insect pests in the forest that are right next to those orchards. Oops. So we monitored BMSB, <laughs> my little titmouse, um, populations near orchards, and um, then I misnetted birds. So a misnet is a really big net. It has four deep pockets in it. So you set it up and it kind of camouflages with um, whatever, hopefully, you're, um, where you're misnetting. So in this case, forests. So those arrows, those white arrows are actually pointing to where the misnets are located. So the bird flies in and it falls into a pocket. So we can pull the bird out of that pocket, give it a band, and at the same time, collect a fecal sample. So what I did was use, um, species specific calls of the birds that I heard in these forests that were next to orchards. I would call the birds in, misnet them, ban them, oops, and collect a fecal sample. So we would place the birds basically in like a brown paper lunch sack and hold them for about 10 minutes, wait till they um, went to the bathroom, and then we would let them um, fly free. So for this study, I collected over 200 bird turds from 19 species of birds, but I specifically targeted six insectivorous species, insectivorous birds um, that were really common in all of the orchards I was working. So that's Eastern Tohi, Carolina Wren, Tufted Titmouse, White-Eyed Vireo, Field Sparrow, and Northern Cardinal. So we found really low incidence of birds eating BMSB, but that's not actually that surprising because birds metabolize really fast. They might completely metabolize a stink bug in 30 minutes to four hours. And so unless they had just eaten a stink bug, it's unlikely that I would have picked it up. Stink bugs are also really smelly and I'm guessing not a favored source of food, like a crunchy caterpillar, juicy caterpillar. Um, and so we were really excited to find that birds are eating BMSB. And we expect that this is actually probably a pretty conservative estimate of how much BMSB that they are eating. Um, but a bigger question is, are birds good or bad in these orchard systems? A lot of growers would prefer not to have any birds. Um, in their system. But some of these forests that surround the orchards are actually pretty nice, undisturbed habitat. Um, so birds can be bad if they have fecal contamination. So maybe they spread disease. Some birds like cat birds really love to eat fruits. And so that is not good. But then you have other birds who are insectivorous and might actually provide some pest control services, which is great. The issue is if the insectivorous birds are eating too many of our arthropod uh, natural enemies, so the predators or parasitoids. So that's what I'm working on with this next um, part of the study. And so I'm so excited. I actually just put this together this week <laughs> where we're starting to actually look at the different arthropod groups that these birds are eating. So what you're looking at here in this pie chart is a breakdown of all of the DNA we collected out of all of the birds captured. So a few groups that are very common. Um, one would be Araneae or spiders. So spiders are predators and they're really good to have in orchards. So this would actually be a disservice to growers for birds to eat spiders. We found Hemiptera, which includes the brown marmorated and other stink bugs. Diptera, so flies, coleoptera, which are beetles, so that uh, it depends. <laughs> and then a huge, huge proportion of bird diets were the lepidoptera. So again, these are the caterpillars, butterflies, and moths. Um, so what we're working on now is going through a list of about 300 species of insects to categorize that insect as a pest in peach and pecan, a um, pest or herbivore just generally, but maybe not to that system, a natural enemy, so a predator or a parasitoid, and 
everything else. Um, so we can start to understand kind of that trade-off um, between how many pests are they eating, pest control services versus um, eating what we would refer to as beneficial insects. So to be continued. <laughs> Um, so now I'll just talk a little tiny bit about a new project that I've just started at VSU, um, which is looking at the effects of noise on bird and frog communities. So specifically going out to the Okefenokee Swamp, um, and we're interested in ecotourism noise. Um, so like the noise from people going to visit the swamp or from some of the motorboats that go, um, motorized boats that go through some of the canals and looking at whether that changes or affects vocal communities. So again, specifically birds and frogs. Like I said, this just started. So we have our first round of recordings that we picked up in March, and we should be going out again in the next month or so to switch out recorders and download some of our sound recordings. Um, so we're using what are called passive acoustic monitors to record bird and frog communities. So this is a that little teeny tiny green box is a picture of our recording unit. So there's three AA batteries and a microphone in there. And it's set to record for five minutes every hour, 24 hours a day. There's also like a little tag you might see. That's an eye button, which measures temperature. Um, so I'm very new to working with frogs, but frog calls vary based on temperature. <laughs> So we're also tracking temperature, so we can look at um, patterns that way, too. So here is a little bit of what we have been hearing. So here's one. So there's a couple of different animals there, but that um, is a recording of two Carolina wrens calling back and forth. And then in the background, you might have heard a pig frog and a cricket frog. Here's another recording. So that is a recording of a cricket frog. And we are finding cricket frogs, which are teeny, teeny, tiny little frogs, um, are very, very common throughout the swamp. I don't have any pretty pictures here, but hopefully you can hear these recordings. Here's the first one. So this is a pretty common bird. That is the Northern Perula, which we're finding um, not in the wetland portion. Um, we're also doing some recordings in the upland part of the swamps, around the, well, around the swamp. Oops. We have to hear this one, it's really good. So there's two birds calling there. The first one was a Bachman sparrow, followed by a pine warbler and then the Bachman Sparrow called again. Um, so we were very excited to pick up Bachman Sparrow on our first round of recordings because that's a state listed species. Oops. So to identify um, the different birds and frogs, we are using spectrograms um, and sounds. So one of the great things about this project is that it's very accessible for undergraduate students. Um, so we're training undergrads in the lab to ID. Well, I work on the bird ID. I work with someone else who's on frog ID, but I'm learning my frog IDs. Um, so they're learning the students, the undergrads at VSU are starting to learn a lot of our local species by sound, also using these spectrograms to confirm what they're hearing based on that pattern. So this top recording is a cricket frog. Um, which kind of sounds like marbles hitting each other. That's how I've heard it described. 
And then this bottom call is the northern parula. So a very distinctive pattern on that spectrogram, which allows um, either myself or some of the student uh, research assistants to ID that bird song. So we'll continue to make recordings and ID these different bird calls and frog calls uh, in the different habitats around the Okie Finoki. <laughs> There's both of them. <laughs> so <laughs> that is a, a small snippet of um, some of the work that I have done looking at how human um, induced or human generated environmental change affects how animals behave, especially singing behavior and how they interact. So what they eat. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, I'm embarrassed to admit until today, I had not realized house wrens and Carolina wrens are different species. They are, yeah. Carolina wrens are much bigger. Um, they have a different call. So house wrens tend to um, build nests in nest boxes. Carolina wrens, they'll use a nest box, but they're just as likely to like build a nest in your flower pot or your garage, a boot, <laughs> whatever they find. Flower pots here are very popular. Yeah, my house too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cricket frog, that's the thing around here. Well, we know it rained enough because the cricket frogs have come out. Yep. Cricket frogs, spring peepers. Um, so we're definitely picking up on a ton of cricket frogs, a ton of pig frogs, um, some leopard frogs, tree frogs, some of the different tree frogs. Um, what we're definitely listening for is the gopher frog. There's a historical record that it was recorded on the southeastern border of the swamp, I think mm -hmm. by Chesser Island, um, but I'm not sure that anyone in recent history has heard one singing there mm -hmm. or breeding. If it's really, uh, Chesser Island's pretty much the east edge. If it's really the southeast edge, that could be relevant to the mine issue because mm -hmm. the mine is going to be outside the southeast edge of the swamp. Yeah, I can show you a map. Um, I don't have it handy right now, but I could find one and we could look. So that's the way it always works. Somebody asked a question where I have that. but <laughs> I have the answer somewhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, Rindy, you there? She's probably got called away to work. Yeah, uh, I'm still here. Got any questions? No, I, it's very interesting. Thank you. I'm sure you've heard of the case of the Florida snail kite, mm -hmm. where it's, it's in the Everglades and it traditionally ate apple snails. Okay. The problem being due to water diversions and other methods, a larger snail showed up from the islands mm -hmm. and the bird couldn't eat them they were too big but it only took 10 years for the birds to evolve to be bigger with 10 percent bigger bills as well till now they're happy with the happier the bigger snails yeah more food so i wonder what kind of you know as you continue this work i wonder what you will observe of actual changes in the birds due to human effects. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It will be interesting to see. Um, and now, so this type of research has been happening for about 25 years now, like really, really focusing in on noise effects on birds. Um, and so I suspect there will be some really nice long-term studies that will be produced um, with that data. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, I went to a meeting of something called the Okefenokee Partnership. Its purpose is to promote um, ecotourism and, and some other related things. Basically, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship in the four counties surrounding the Okefenokee Swamp, Ware, Clinch, and Charlton 
County is Georgia and Baker County, Florida. And um, which seems to mesh with what you're doing. If they actually get more tourists to show up, how is that going to affect the birds and the frogs and the rest of the wildlife? I think it's a good question that we need to think about, um, especially if the Okefenokee is awarded World Heritage status, um, mm -hmm. which I haven't heard. I know it's under review, but I don't think that decision has been made yet. Um, but I, it I, hasn't I, been. It hasn't been made, and the U.S. only gets one chance each year. And in the last eight years, there have only been two, so it's really one every four years. Okay. And there are other uh, candidates in the U.S. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it's something that scientists, conservation biologists, advocates for the Okefenokee need to think about. Like um, where, how much noise is acceptable? So um, sometimes it's not necessarily the people who are going to visit parks that produce all of the noise. It's all of the infrastructure to maintain mm. those parks, like leaf blowers and lawn mowers and anything else you can imagine that's really, really noisy that disturbs the animals. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what we find. Well, maybe I can put you in touch with them because, uh, they're planning an entrepreneur boot camp. Okay. Yeah. With, and, uh, they have, uh, this, a professor from VSU who's already associated with it. I don't have it right oh, here. Probably but... Brad. Uh, I don't think so. I think I would have recognized, you're yeah. talking about Brad Bergstrom? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would have recognized his name. I think it was somebody else. Okay. And part of the discussion yesterday is they have several major segments. One of them was actually going to be optional and only part of the day, which was, you know, actually going to the swamp and observing the ecology and talking to the local people and talking to the tourists after discussions like okay it's going to be all day <laughs> <laughs> and that might be something that you might want to at least advise on and maybe participate in yeah absolutely um, i love the okefenokee and i love that it's a quiet place where you can actually go and be in a really really beautiful quiet location um, and it's such a unique feature of South Georgia that, yeah, definitely invested in the Okefenokee. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, every year we do a paddle out Floyd's Island and camp out. Who knows? You might want to come along on that. I haven't done an overnight paddle. I would really like to. <laughs> you know, one of our members, Shirley Kokidko, she loves to organize those every year. Yeah. So it'll happen again. That sounds good. All righty, I don't want to keep you forever. Um, so. All right, well, um, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> sure do appreciate it. I find it very interesting. And I think people who watch the recording will as well as other people who are going to attend, but they have work schedules even more uh, drastic than Rindy's. <laughs> well, I appreciate found it. Yeah, one of their founding board members, he's an uh, ophthalmologist, so I don't think he even takes a lunch break, really. I understand. <laughs> anyway, sure do appreciate it, and um, we'll put the recording up in the next couple of days, and maybe I'll put you in touch with the Okefenokee Partnership people, and perhaps sometime you'd like to come on some of our outings. Sounds great. Thank you. All righty. All right. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye for now.